government business, bills, first reading, the appropriation, July 2015 to June 2016, bill 2015. I recognize the Honorable Minister responsible for finance. The bill has been deemed to have been read a first time and is now set down for its second reading. Madam Speaker, I beg to move the second reading. Second reading, the appropriation, July 2015 to June 2016, bill 2015. Honorable Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to read. I beg to move the second reading of a bill entitled The Appropriation, July 2015 to June 2016, Bill 2015. The bill has been duly moved. Does the Honorable Minister of Finance wish to speak to this bill? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do. Please proceed. Can the copies please be distributed to members? Madam Speaker, it is with tremendous pride and great optimism that I stand before this Honorable House to speak to the appropriation July 2015 to June 2016 bill 2015. I will begin my address today by giving thanks to the Lord, without whose guidance and direction I would be unable to stand here before you to present my third budget since taking office in May 2013. Two years ago, when I delivered my first ever budget address as the newly appointed Minister for Finance and Economic Development, our country faced sizable, sizable challenges. Most notable among them was the deficient state of government's finances, strained relations with the United Kingdom, and the uncertain direction of our economy. Whilst at times the road seemed daunting, I remain confident that with faith, perseverance, and prudence, not only would we achieve fiscal sustainability, and repair our, our diplomatic ties, we will ultimately regain the trust of the people and in so doing, enjoy sustained economic growth. Whilst it, is whilst it is possible to continually improve the state of our public finances each year, Madam Speaker, I am pleased to report that our dedicated efforts are now bearing fruit and we are finally on the cusp of restored public finances, a benefit of disciplined governance. Madam Speaker, the government's first priority was to ensure that the public's finances were placed on a sound footing in order to make a positive difference in the lives of our people, a footing which will become the foundation upon which we will build a stronger and more resilient Cayman Islands. As I will outline today in this address, during the 15-16 fiscal year, our cash balances will reach levels never before seen by the government without having borrowed the money. We will once again deliver a surplus budget. Our debt burden will continue to decline and our government will regain full compliance with all principles of responsible financial management as outlined in the Public Management and Finance, finance Law 2013 revision, which I will further refer to as the PMFL. When our fiscal plans come to fruition, Madam Speaker, the government will be better able to serve our citizens and have greater flexibility 
in bringing much needed relief to our citizens through enhanced programs, better infrastructure, increased employment opportunities, and lower fees and taxes. Madam Speaker, the 15-16 budget placed before you represents a historic milestone for our country. It represents this administration's unwavering commitment to maintain accountability in its financial affairs. It is the first budget to achieve full compliance with all six principles of responsible financial management as cited in the framework for fiscal responsibility, other, or otherwise known as the FFR, and reflected in the PMFL. This government has therefore successfully positioned the country to meet all six of these principles by the established target date of 30th June 2016. It should be noted, Madam Speaker, that the inclusion of the FFR into the PMFL significantly raised the bar on what were already very stringent goals with respect to the state of our public finances. By way of example, before the FFR was added to the PMFL, the ratios for the principles of responsible financial management were assessed at the 30th of June each year. When the FFR was passed as an amendment to the PMFL, the assessment date of the 90-day cash reserve ratio was changed to the, 30th of the 31st of December each year, the date at which the government's unrestricted cash balances are at their lowest levels. This meant that the significant cash inflows from financial services fees between January to March were of no assistance in meeting the December cash balance requirements. Therefore, the requirements of the FFR made it more difficult to meet the 90-day cash reserve ratio. Madam Speaker, achieving these enhanced requirements have not been easy. And Madam Speaker, I'll pause to add that the FFR was only added to the PMFL in December 2012, just six months before the 2013 election. Madam Speaker, achieving these enhanced requirements have not been easy. This government had to make many tough decisions along the way, and as a result, we've had to face our fair share of criticism. However, I am confident that the decisions taken were the right decisions and taken in the best interest of the people of the Cayman Islands. With respect to, the, with respect to compliance with principles, Madam Speaker, I will now go into further details on the various principles under the PMFL and how the 15-16 budget forecasts achieve compliance with these principles. Number one, net operating position. For 1516, the requirement that central government revenues be greater than its expenses will be achieved, as the government is forecasting revenues of 661.2 million and operating expenditures of 539.9 million Cayman Islands dollars, resulting in a 121.3 million CI dollars net operating surplus. Number two, net worth. At the end of the 1516, the, the requirement that central government assets, less its liabilities be positive, will be achieved, as the government's assets are forecast to exceed its liabilities by approximately 1.7 billion. Number three, debt service. For 1516, the requirement that annual payments on all public sector debt not be more than 10% of core government revenues will finally be achieved as the government is forecasting a debt service ratio of 9.9%. A significant focus of this government is to reduce the public sector debt burden as aggressively as possible while observing the PMFL requirements that all debt related payments should not exceed the 10% ratio in any fiscal year. As a risk mitigation strategy, and in, it, and in the event of an unforeseen reduction in revenue, which would threaten compliance with the debt service ratio, for the current 14-15 fiscal year, the government has placed CI $17.1 million into a debt service sinking fund 
which it will be able to draw upon to remain within a 10% limit. The total balance of the sinking fund now stands at CI $18 million. Number four, net debt. For 15-16, the requirement that the total debt of central government plus the weighted average debt balance of public entities less central government's liquid assets be no more than 80% of central government's revenue will be achieved as the government is forecasting a net debt ratio of 4 to 5.5%. This is well below the legally prescribed limit of 80%. Number five, cash reserves. For 15-16, the requirement that the unrestricted cash reserves of the government at the 31st of December 2015 be sufficient to cover 90 days of operating expenditures will be achieved as the government is forecast to have sufficient cash reserves to cover approximately 94.7 days of operating expenditure at the 31st of December 2015. The estimated lowest point during the fiscal year for unrestricted cash reserves. And lastly, number six, financial risk. For 1516, the government will continue to manage its risk prudently by maintaining sufficient insurance coverage on all government property and major potential liabilities and remain prepared in the event of a hurricane or other unforeseen adverse event. Madam Speaker, full compliance is a significant milestone which should not be overlooked. We should remind ourselves of the underlying objective of the PMFL, which is to promote vigilance and transparency in the management of government's finances. The PMFL, with the inclusion of the FFR, required the government to improve accountability in all its public sector operations, a task which this administration has complied with and remains committed to. However, before I delve further into the fundamentals of the government's proposed budget for 2015-16, I will take a few minutes to reflect on the steps we have taken to this point, as it is worth evaluating the changes we have made to restore government's finances. With respect to the 2013-14 unaudited actuals, the 13-14 fiscal year ended with a 109.1 million operating surplus for the entire public sector. This amount was 8.9 million greater than the full year original budget surplus of 100.2 million. Public entities reported, reported a 9.1 million surplus, while central government achieved a $100 million surplus. This positive change in the operating performance was mainly due to higher than anticipated operating revenues coupled with lower than, expect, lower than expected operating expenses and was achieved despite the 2.5% gratuitous payment of $3.7 million to the civil servants by the government in June 2014. Total revenue for 2013-14 were 2.6 million more than the 644.7 million projected in the approved budget. Higher than expected revenues were largely due to increased activity in the economy, as well as improved efficiency in revenue collections. Specifically, revenues, revenue from increases in total merchandise imports and an uptick in the real estate market all contributed positively to the improved financial performance. Total operating expenses of core government for the year ended 30th June 2014 was $547.3 million, or 2.1 million less than the $549.4 million originally budgeted in 2013-14. These savings can be attributed to the government's concerted effort to manage its expenditures within the confines of the government's four-year medium-term fiscal strategy agreed with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Madam Speaker, the government ended the 13-14 fiscal year practically on budget for personnel costs, spending $238.1 million. This is a testament to this administration's commitment to manage the civil service headcount 
through restrained recruitment and attrition. Included in the amount for personnel costs was $11.4 million paid into the Public Service Pension Fund towards the government's past service liability for civil service and parliamentarian pension benefits. Total supplies and consumables were $88.1 million. This was $2.8 million less than the original 2013-14 budget anticipated. This was largely due to underspend for items such as travel and professional consultation fees. Total depreciation expense for the year was $25.9 million. This was $2.1 million less than budgeted. The delayed acquisition of certain assets which were originally planned to be acquired earlier in the year created these savings, Madam Speaker. For total debt overall, the government saved $0.9 million, or in other words, 900,000 Cayman Islands dollars in finance costs during the 13-14 fiscal year. This was due to our aggressive efforts to renegotiate interest rates, reduce the balance of public debt, minimize the use of the overdraft facility, and this administration stands on refraining from any new borrowings. Madam Speaker, compared to fiscal year 2012-2013, when the actual expense of CI 800,000 or 0.8 million was incurred on bank overdraft interest only, this administration reduced overdraft interest to $100,000 or 0.1 million during its first year in office 2013-14 and then completely eliminated overdraft interest charges during the current 14-15 fiscal year. Madam Speaker, in other words, we only spend to the extent we can afford to and we do not plan to enter into any debt instruments to finance recurrent expenditure. The government spent 102.2 million Cayman Islands dollars on outputs from statutory authorities and government-owned companies during the 13-14 fiscal year. This amount was $1.5 million over the budgeted amount and was primarily a result of increased demand for medical services at the Health Services Authority, as well as an increase in output funding to the University College of the Cayman Islands. Outputs from non-government output suppliers were $1.3 million over budget during the 2013-14 fiscal year. This was mainly due to the unpre unpredictable nature of certain expenditures, such as legal aid services under the Bill of Rights, services for refugees, and overseas medical care. Madam Speaker, the government spent $31.1 million in transfer payments for the 2013-14 fiscal year, which was a savings of $2 million from what was originally budgeted. Part of these savings stem from the government's efforts to regularize the Young Nation Builders Scholarship Program by properly aligning the terms and conditions of those scholarships with those of the Education Council to ensure equal treatment for all persons receiving scholarships from the government. Statutory authorities and government-owned companies recorded a combined net operating surplus of $9.1 million. This was a positive variance of $4.1 million when compared to the original budget. Improved performance was seen in various SAGCs. In particular, the Port Authority ended the 13-14 fiscal year with a surplus, thanks to increased cargo volume. Additionally, the Civil Aviation Authority had a successful year in 13-14, posting the highest net income ever realized by the authority mainly as a result of prudent management of the authority's finances, as well as a significant growth in the Cayman Islands Aircraft Registry. Other contributors to this positive variance were the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, the Water Authority, the Cayman Islands National Insurance Company, or CINICO as it is commonly known, the Cayman Islands Airports Authority, and the Maritime Authority.
Madam Speaker, I will speak briefly about our public entities, which are usually not the area of focus during annual budget presentations. However, they are worthy of attention as collectively, along with having first call on the country's revenue, they incur operating expenditures of approximately CI $300 million annually and account for approximately 40% of the total operating expenses of the entire public sector. Madam Speaker, for several years following the introduction of the government's financial reform in 2004, the government's budget featured a line item called net deficit of statutory authorities and government-owned companies. The people of these islands expect that this progressive-led administration will ensure that all public entities utilize their financial resources in a manner that benefits the country as a whole. Madam Speaker, we have instituted real management and guidance, challenging the public entities to improve their overall financial performance and holding them accountable for delivery. As a result, we are no longer seeing collective net deficits. Rather, we are seeing growing surpluses as loss-making agencies reduce their losses, while profit-making agencies increase their returns to central government. Madam Speaker, I have said it before, and will always believe that since they operate with delegated authority from the central government, the relationship between central government and SAGCs should be like that of parent and subsidiary companies, as is common in the corporate world. Our 26 statutory authorities and government companies are, of, are, not as insignificant, are not an insignificant part of the entire public sector, Madam Speaker. And I believe that, results, that the results speak for themselves when the entire group contributes to lifting the country out of its previous economic and financial challenges. Many of these institutions were created with the best of intentions to deliver critical services, regulate important industries, or promote various aspects of our culture. However, somewhere along the way, a few have gone off the rails. Public institutions can either advance or hinder social and economic progress. And as the Minister with Responsibility for Finance and Economic Development, it is my duty to ensure, with the support of my colleagues, at least as far, at least from a fiscal management perspective, that these institutions do not hinder, but rather serve to advance progress in this country, socially, financially, and economically. Madam Speaker, returning now to the results of operations for the fiscal year ended 30th June 2014, total assets of the government were 2.27 billion, of which property, plant, and equipment was 1.74 billion Cayman Islands dollars. Total liabilities were 855.6 million, and total net assets were 1.42 billion Cayman Islands dollars. Government's debt balance stood at 548.9 million Cayman Islands dollars at the 30th of June 2014. This amount continues to decrease with scheduled payments, Madam Speaker. Total overall closing bank account balances at the 30th of June 2014 was CI $173.9 million, of which $108.3 million was held in reserve and restricted bank accounts, whilst the operating bank account had a positive balance of $65.6 .6 million Cayman Islands dollars. Madam Speaker, I would like to further highlight that the 2013-14 annual accounts were prepared and submitted in line with the statutory deadline of the 31st of October, 2014. These accounts are expected to be audited before the end of this current fiscal year. This will result in the first set of audited entire public sector accounts since the PMFL came into effect in 2004. Overall, the financial results for 2013-14 speak for themselves and demonstrate that this administration has gotten off to a strong start in the management of the country's affairs during their first year in office. With no borrowing, 
during the 2013-14 fiscal year, central governments on audited $100 million operating surplus provided the funding for capital expenditure and investments of 41.2 million CI dollars, as well as a means of repaying government's debt principal obligations of $25.5 million. The operating surplus also increased government's cash reserves during the year, which was necessary in order for the government to comply with its legal obligations to have sufficient cash balances to meet 90 days of operating expenditure. The further consideration that will be examined is whether to make a transfer of some cash balances to general reserves, Madam Speaker. Given that the government deliberately chose to manage its finances without the use of an overdraft facility, the operating bank account balance must always remain positive and always be sufficient to pay government's expenses. Making a transfer of cash to general reserves means that in the event of a subsequent need to use the amount transferred, the approval of the Legislative Assembly is required, and the time required to obtain approval may not allow for urgent use of the funds transferred to General Reserves. Hence, the amount of any transfer to General Reserves requires careful estimation, but such a transfer is noble, Madam Speaker, because in layman terms, it would represent the government's achievement in putting aside funds for a rainy day. And Madam Speaker, this is comparable to a business deciding whether to place more funds in a fixed deposit or to keep their checking account or to keep it in their checking account to be utilized in meeting their expenses. Nevertheless, the government gives the country its assurance that whenever a transfer can be made to the general reserves, it will be made to the greatest extent possible. With respect to the 2014-15 financial forecast, Madam Speaker, I will now focus briefly on the forecast financial results for the current 2014-15 fiscal year as they form the foundation for the 2015-16 budget. At the 31st of March 2015, the forecast operating surplus for the financial year ended th ending 30th June 2015 was 134.6 million Cayman Islands dollars, 6.6 .6 million dollars more than the 128 million originally anticipated in the 14-15 budget. The government's operating revenues were forecast to be 660.2 million Cayman Islands dollars. This amount is 2.4 million dollars more than the 657.8 million originally budgeted. Increased activity in the domestic economy and the US economy, as well as the growing demand for our tourism product, positively impacted various revenue streams, resulting in an increase in merchandise imports and a significant upsurge in real estate sales. The forecast 2014-15 operating expenses of core government is 538, 7 million compared to 536.8 million originally budgeted for the year. Once again, the government remains steadfast in carefully managing its expenditures. Personnel costs for 2014-15 are forecast to come in below budget at 232.3 million or 9.5 million dollars less than originally budgeted. The government has continued its efforts to gradually downsize the civil service and has placed special attention on improving employee efficiency in order to enhance the value and the provision of government services. Turning to financing expenses, Madam Speaker, the government is forecast to come in on budget at $28.5 million in financing expenses for the 2014-15 fiscal year. As a result of continued prudent financial management, the government was able to operate throughout the 2014-15 year, fiscal year without the need 
for an overdraft facility. Outputs from non-government output suppliers are forecast to be 6.9 million higher than the original budget. This is primarily due to an overutilization of overseas medical care, along with increased costs for the custody, care, and repatriation of the Cuban refugees, Madam Speaker. The net surplus of statutory authorities and government-owned companies is forecast to be 13.1 million for the fiscal year ending 30th June 2015. This amount is 6 million more than the 7.1 million included in the 1415 budget. The Kimmel Islands Airport Authority, Cynico, and the Health Services Authority have all been performing better than expected. Cayman Airways has also been experiencing positive results, and this is due to increased air arrivals, coupled with lower operating costs as a result of declining fuel prices. Increasing cruise visitor arrivals also positively, positively impacted the Port Authority. As I noted earlier, Madam Speaker, it is no longer business as usual, and the interventions of this government is driving accountability. In driving accountability, is starting to bear fruit. As a result of increased revenues and reduced operating expenditure, the central government is forecast to have closing bank account balances totaling 269.6 million Cayman Islands dollars. This amount is $13.5 million more than the $256.1 million shown in the 2014-15 budget. The very important operating bank account balance is expected to be $138.4 million at the 30th of June 2015, and restricted cash balances will make up the difference of $131.2 million Cayman Islands dollars. Madam Speaker, preliminary results for fiscal year 2014-15 show that we are on track yet again to outperform the initial budget expectations and poise to, fulfill, poise to fulfill our obligations towards achieving FFR compliance by 30th of June 2016. Turning now to economic outlook for 2015-16 to the 2017-18 period. Madam Speaker, the economic landscape over the medium term looks favorable. Overall growth for our country, particularly as it relates to our tourism sector, is foreseen to be, to be on an upward trajectory. Although our domestic sector is contingent on growth in the advanced economies, recent projections for these economies suggest accelerated recovery. In particular, GDP growth for the United States is projected to jump from 2.4% in 2014 to 3.1% in 2015, and that is despite the first quarter performance in the United States, Madam Speaker. Domestic private consumption and investment will continue to support our growth since government's commitment to the FFR has significantly impacted its role as the major stimulator for the economy through increased expenditure. Notwithstanding the government's limitations under the FFR, as with previous years, this year's economic stimulus package of CI $20.1 million is geared at reducing the cost of doing business through lowered input duties is expected to positively impact disposable income and domestic demand. Economic growth over the medium term is also expected to be driven by the construction sector, Madam Speaker, stemming from a number of private sector investment projects. These include the new Kimpton Hotel and condominiums on Seven Mile Beach and the redevelopment of the former Hyatt Beach Suites Hotel once completed, these projects are expected to directly boost our tourism offerings while generating indirect economic benefits in areas such as wholesale and retail, transport, and the utility sectors. Madam Speaker, in addition to the economic stimulus package implemented by the government, 
This administration has identified five major projects which are expected to boost investment and economic growth. These are the Georgetown Cruise Birthing Facility, the Owen Roberts International Airport Terminal Upgrade, the revitalization of Georgetown, the extension of the East-West Arterial Road, and a new solid waste management facility. In particular, a higher growth prospect for the tourism sector is anticipated over the long term from the airport and cruise berthing projects. Madam well, Speaker, external demand is also likely to be boosted by the Health City Cayman Islands Hospital, now that the hospital is JCI accredited and has received the gold seal of approval from Joint Commission International. Madam well, Speaker, barring any major global events, whether man-made or natural, which would negatively impact the growth of our tourism and financial services, real GDP or gross domestic product growth for the Cayman Islands is forecast at 2.1% in 2015-16. Thereafter, the growth rate is forecast to grow to 2.3% in 2016-17 and 2.6% in 2017-18. With, with respect to inflation, Madam Speaker, with the anticipated boost to domestic demand for goods and services resulting from the increase in tourism, along with the implementation of various infrastructure projects, slightly higher inflation rates are projected over the coming years. This is to be expected as inflation is a natural byproduct of growth and development in any economy. For fiscal year 2015-16, inflation is forecast at 1.7%, up from 1.4% in 2014-15. This assumes global oil prices will remain sufficiently low enough to dampen the buildup in inflationary pressure due to higher domestic demand for goods and services related to tourism and construction. Thereafter, the inflation rate is forecast to increase to 2% in 2016-17 and then to 2.4% in 2017-18. With respect to unemployment, Madam Speaker, the unemployment rate is expected to be 4.7% in 2014-15 and remain at 4.7% in 2015-16 because of an expected increase in the labor force due to an increase in the retirement age from 60 to 65 and the natural increase in the working age population amongst Caymanians. Thereafter, the unemployment rate will decline to 4.5% in 2016-17 and it is expected to remain at 4.5% in 2017-18. New employment opportunities are expected to be created directly and indirectly from the public and private construction projects and operation of the major tourism development projects, particularly the Kimpton Hotel, the redevelopment of the former Hyatt Beach Suites Hotel, and the new cruise terminal. Turning now to the current account, Madam Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the growth in imports and remittances are expected to be outweighed by the growth in inflows from tourism and financial services, thereby narrowing the deficit for the current account in the balance of payments from 21.6% of GDP in 2014-15 to 21.1% in 2015-16. While inflows from tourism services are expected to be higher, in the succeeding years. Outflow of payments to the rest of the world are expected to accelerate due to the volume of construction materials and consumable goods imported to facilitate the planned private and public sector projects. Therefore, the current account to GDP ratios are forecast at 22.4% in 2016-17 and 23.2% in 2017-18. Looking now at the 2015-16 financial forecast. Madam Speaker, I would now like to focus the attention of honorable members to the financial forecast included in the 2015-16 budget. Total operating revenues 
are forecast to be 661.2 million. Operating expenditures are forecast to be 525.2 million Cayman Islands dollars. And financing expenses are forecast at 27.6 million Cayman Islands dollars. This results in a core government net operating surplus of 108.4 million Cayman Islands dollars. After factoring in the forecast net operating surplus of the statutory authorities and government owned companies of CI 12.9 million, the entire public sector is forecast to record a net operating surplus of 121.3 million Cayman Islands dollars. The 2015-16 net operating cash flows are forecast to be CI 139.6 million. This will be used to fund capital expenditure and equity investments of CI $50.3 million, make principal debt repayments of CI $20 million. Other cash inflows expected during the year amount to CI $2.7 million, and the remaining balance of CI $72 million will be, will be used to further improve government's operating cash balances. As you can see, Madam Speaker, the financial results for the 2015-16 year are well aligned with the requirements of the FFR and the compliance date of 30th June 2016. With respect to revenues, Madam Speaker, this government said from the outset that it would not introduce any new revenue measures. That is a commitment we've kept and all things being equal, one that we intend to keep for the duration of our term. Madam Speaker, the revenue that the government collects is an absolute necessity as it enables the government to improve our infrastructure, provide education opportunities for our children, health care and security for our citizens, and provide for the less fortunate among us. The 2015-16 forecast operating revenue of CI $661.2 million includes no new revenue measures and represents a very conservative 1% growth rate over what was budgeted for 2014-15. This is possible because of the growth in the domestic economy, Madam Speaker. This government has recognized the challenges faced by many Caymanians on a daily basis in trying to make ends meet. The government therefore took steps to provide relief to the average citizen through the reduction of rates for their revenue items, which will continue to have maximum impact on disposable income and the economy over the coming year. Madam Speaker, as you know, there are few tangible goods produced in the Cayman Islands, and much of what we consume is imported from elsewhere. The reduction of two percentage points on the majority of dutable items was one measure that the government implemented in 2014-15, which will continue for the 2015-16 fiscal year. Madam Speaker, everyone knows that the cost of electricity in the Cayman Islands account for a major part of private household spending, as well as the cost of doing business. In 2014-15, the government began to provide some relief by reducing the import duty placed on diesel fuel consumed by CUC by 25 cents per gallon, which took effect in January 2015. The value of the revenue foregone from January to June 2015 is estimated to be 4.2 million Cayman Islands dollars. For the 2015-16, the 25 cents duty reduction equates to additional disposable income of 4.2 million between July to December 2015, and a further 4.2 million boost between January to June 2016. In addition to what has been detailed above, Madam Speaker, the government will again reduce the import duty placed on diesel fuel consumed by CUC by an additional 25 cents per gallon starting 
1st of January, 2016. This means that the government will forsake a further CI $4.2 million during the last six months of the 2015-16 fiscal year. Therefore, the total diesel duty reduction from January 2015 to June 2016 is CI 16.8 million Cayman Islands dollars. When considering each of the 25 cents reduction that were taken in June, in, sorry, in January 2015 and January 2016. This reduction will provide further relief to the cost of electricity, as well as generate increased disposable income to be spent within the local economy. Once again, it is expected that additional disposable income will result in a greater level of spending in the economy, which will provide increased activity for business entities, greater opportunities for employment, and enhanced quality of life for individuals. Madam Speaker, the total stimulus package in the 2015-16 budget is CI 20.1 million, 12.6 million in diesel duty reduction, and 7.5 million in a cost of living adjustment to the civil service. This represents a direct increase to disposable income to be spent within the local economy. Turning now to operating expenditures. Madam Speaker, the 2015-16 forecast for core government operating expenses is CI $552.8 million, inclusive of financing costs. This represents $16 million increase from 2014-15 budgeted expenditure level. This increase includes, among others, the government's planned award of a 4% cost of living adjustment, which is expected to cost the government CI $7.5 million, $3.8 million to purchase outputs from SEMA or the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, $1.8 million to Cynico with respect to health insurance benefits for pensioners, $0.9 million to fund additional recipients under the Siemens ex gratia regime, $0.7 million of additional funding with respect to the e-government initiative, and $0.5 million for salary, salary regrades during the fiscal year. Madam Speaker, this government will not allow fiscal constraints and the challenges of our present circumstances to prevent us from capitalizing on key opportunities and making short-term sacrifices to realize long-term benefits. Therefore, Madam Speaker, whilst the 2015-16 budget shows a 3% increase in the government's planned operating expenses, the reality is that we are also making investments into innovative methods of delivering enhanced services to our citizens, which will make the government more efficient and save the country money in the medium to long term. Madam Speaker, we are aware that we must do more with less. However, it is equally important that we identify those priority areas that will place the country and our people in the best possible position for this and future generations to grow and develop economically and socially. Yes, we are going to do more with less as we have been doing, but more importantly, we are going to do things right. That means we are focusing on investments in education for our people, for their upward mobility, social advancement, and to reach the level of economic prosperity that is the potential of every Caymanian. We will invest in necessary infrastructure to facilitate growth and diversification and support the key pillars of our economy. We will invest in modern technology and we will improve government services at all levels. But we are not going to increase the tax burden in order to do so. The government has a firm grip on the situation, Madam Speaker. The initiatives that the government is working on and are funded in the 2015-16 budget are, number one, 
preparing the management framework to facilitate implementation of approved recommendations from the, Ian, from the Ernst & Young report in regards to project future. Number two, investing in e-government initiatives to improve access, service levels, and efficiency across the public sector. Number three, establishing the Central Procurement Office, which will bring efficiencies to the government by leveraging our significant buying power. And number four, establishing a major projects office, which will manage the government's major project initiatives, such as the airport redevelopment, the cruise berthing facility, and the integrated solid waste management system. Madam Speaker, the major components of the operating expenses in the appropriation bill are as follows. Personnel costs are budgeted at $252.4 million which includes the provision of $11.4 million to be paid into the Public Service Pension Fund towards the government's past service liability for civil service pension benefits. Personnel costs are by far the largest component of the government's budget. Also included in the government's fiscal plan is a cost of living adjustment of 4% for civil servants. As the government noted in the presentation, on the, of the strategic policy statement last November. The 4% is significantly less than the cumulative growth of inflation since the last cost of living adjustment, which took, which took into account inflation, which took into account inflation rates to 2007. Madam Speaker, whilst the government would like to do more and to catch up with the rate of inflation, <clears throat> we have to be cognizant that our continued fiscal constraints and the need for ongoing sacrifices for the benefit of the entire country. Madam Speaker, any government should recognize that they do not govern for the sole benefit of the public service. They govern for the benefit of the entire country with the assistance of the public service. There are other important points that need to be made with respect to the award of the 4% cost of living adjustment, Madam Speaker. Number one, the award is not funded by any new taxes being implemented. The award is funded by operational savings and existing revenues, and there will not be any increases to existing taxes, fees, and charges. And number two, the cost of living adjustment should not be inflationary within the economy since there is no added cost to taxpayers and businesses by way of increased taxes, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I wish to take a few minutes to speak about a matter concerning the civil service personnel costs, a matter which successive governments have neglected. Madam Speaker, I am proud to be a part of the progressive-led government that has the will and fortitude to deal with some of the more difficult issues to which previous administrations have taken the ostrich approach. One of those issues, Madam Speaker, is the government's current post-retirement health care benefits plan. Madam Speaker, the Mercer report shows that if this country continues with the present regime, we will be facing a health care liability of approximately $1.18 billion Cayman Islands dollars. The estimated operating costs in relation to post-retirement health care benefits for this year was $135 million Cayman Islands dollars. Madam Speaker, that analysis suggests that without taking the necessary steps, it is the country that will suffer. Madam Speaker, this Honorable House enacted legislation which requires the government to ensure that its fiscal plans do not entail annual operating costs which are greater than the expected revenues from the same fiscal year. In other words, when it comes to the current post-retirement health care benefit regime, we have to accept 
that it is simply unaffordable and something must be done in the best long-term interest of the Cayman Islands. If left unresolved in three years, the current post-retirement health care regime will cost the government approximately $161.8 million Cayman Islands dollars for the 2017-18 fiscal year. Such a situation will limit the government's ability to provide future relief in terms of reduced fees and taxes to the country, as we would need to keep the government's revenues sufficiently high enough to absorb such significant costs, and may even impinge upon the provision of essential services. As I said in my address in the 2015-16 Strategic Policy Statement, the government intends to own this problem and to do something about it. Now that we have, now that we have the Mercer Report, Madam Speaker, we are in the process of negotiating appropriate measures which we hope will be sustainable for the country. Working with our actuaries and the civil service, the government will be considering the feasibility of the following measures. Number one, we will raise the retirement age from 60 to 65 years. Madam Speaker, present life expectancy in the Cayman Islands is approximately 82 years. Therefore, by increasing the retirement age by five years, the period of time that employees will be drawing post-retirement benefits could be reduced by as much as 25%. However, this does not only benefit the country, it also allows willing and able civil servants to earn a higher salary as compared to a pension, negotiate lower mortgage payments with more years to repay their mortgages, and the associated mental and physical health benefits of working and remaining active. Number two, capping the lifetime limits on claims. Madam Speaker, presently, every civil servant enjoys a lifetime maximum on health insurance claims of CI $5 million. Very few actually reach that limit, but the fact that it exists results in a potential liability that is quite high. The government will therefore propose to lower that limit to a more realistic figure, which will also limit government's potential future liability. For the sake of comparison, Madam Speaker, private sector employees usually have a lifetime maximum limit of US Oh, sorry, of $2 million, and that is for the very senior employees and partners in professional firms. Number three, government plans to introduce a graduated post-retirement benefit scheme. It is unreasonable, Madam Speaker, nor can this country afford for someone to spend 30 plus years of their working career in the private sector and join the government at age 50, then retire in 10 years with the same full coverage of lifetime free medical as someone who has worked their entire career in the civil service. But that is the present regime, and it is simply unsustainable. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, while the aforementioned measures will begin to address the health care liability, we must do more. Madam Speaker, the EY report recommended, and I quote, that we should introduce copay and deductibles for all cynical customers. Given that the majority of cynical customers are civil servants and health care benefits are part of their contractual terms and conditions of service, we will request the Deputy Governor, as head of the civil service, to present a business case to Cabinet on the feasibility of this recommendation and potential impacts on the civil service, civil servants, cynical, and the health services authority. What is clear, Madam Speaker, is that we cannot ignore the problem, but we must fully understand the complexity of the issue and develop a solution that is both effective and sustainable. We aim to have a modernized benefit strategy in place by 2018. Therefore, Madam Speaker, in the interest of transparency and full disclosure, 
The government has acknowledged the cost of this issue in the notes to the 2015-16 financial statements. We intend to work assiduously with all, state, all stakeholders to arrive at a solution that is equitable, fair, and most importantly, Madam Speaker, one that this country can afford. Continuing with the 2015-16 forecast operating expenditures, supplies and consumables are budgeted at 89.5 million. This reflects a marginal decrease when compared to the estimated expenditure of $90.7 million for 2014-15. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding, the government has included provisions for important investments in e-government, support for school facilities, and various other ancillary costs to support ongoing service delivery. Outputs from statutory authorities and government-owned companies are budgeted to be $98.7 million for 2015-16. This amount is $4.6 million more than the forecast $94.1 million for 2014-15. Madam Speaker, the importance of the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority to our crucial financial services industry cannot be overemphasized. Therefore, when CIMA reported to the government that it may not yield the previous expect may not yield the previously expected level of revenue from the hedge funds directorship, directorship fees, the government took swift action in providing an additional output funding of CI 3.8 million to ensure that there would be no interruption to the operations of that agency. Madam Speaker, earlier I spoke about the growing concern of increased costs associated with the current post-retirement health care benefits regime. In 2015-16, the government will have to pay an additional $1.8 million to Seneco for the health care coverage of civil service pensioners. Madam Speaker, that payment will bring the total provision paid to Seneco for this coverage to 21.4 million Cayman Islands dollars for 2015-16. That figure, Madam Speaker, is twice the amount the government will provide to SEMA to regulate our entire financial services industry. 2015-16. It serves as yet another reminder that something must be done and soon. Outputs from non-governmental output suppliers are budgeted to be 22.8 million for 2015-16. The major items in this category are 11.4 million dollars for the provision of overseas medical care for indigents. 2.7 million to provide legal aid services to qualified persons. 1.6 million dollars to provide rental assistance to persons in need. And 1.5 million to primar for primary and secondary education by private schools. Madam Speaker, the provision of transfer payments is largely used to support the most vulnerable in our society. It includes programs which provide assistance to our seamen and veterans, provide scholarships to our children, and relief to the poor. For 2015-16, the government has made provisions of 7.6 million for poor relief and payments, poor relief payments and vouchers, 7.1 million in benefits payments to seamen, an ex-servicemen, $11.6 million in scholarships, and $7.7 million in housing assistance. Total transfer payments for 2015-16 are budgeted at $32.6 million Cayman Islands dollars. This amount is $1.3 million higher than the $31.3 million forecast for the current 2014-15 fiscal year. Worthy of noting, Madam Speaker, 
is the government's intention to provide an additional 0.3 million for needs assessment support and 0.9 million to fund additional recipients under the Siemens Ex Gratia regime. Madam Speaker, this country should never forget nor seek to diminish the contributions made by those who came before us, especially our seamen's and veterans, without whose efforts we would be unable to enjoy the economy and the freedoms we now have. Therefore, when it came to achieving these results, when it came to achieving the results required for legal compliance with the FFR, the government was adamant that the budget targets would not be achieved by merely pulling resources away from the most vulnerable, vulnerable within our society. Rather, sacrifices would have to be made in other areas to ensure that we could continue to provide critical support where it is needed. Turning now to financing expenses, Madam Speaker. Financing expenses are budgeted to be 27.6 million Cayman Islands dollars for the 2015-16 fiscal year. This represents a 0.9 million decrease from the 2014-15 forecast amount of 28.5 million dollars. Financing costs will continue on a declining trajectory, Madam Speaker, as the government continues to work hard to reduce public sector debt levels. I am also happy to report, Madam Speaker, that no ancillary borrowing costs will be incurred for 2015-16, as the government does not plan to undertake any new long-term borrowings, nor will it require the use of any overdraft facilities. Depreciation and amortization are budgeted to be $27.3 million for the 2015-16 fiscal year. This reflects the annual wear and tear on various government assets in the provision of goods and services. Whilst no cash is actually expended for depreciation, under accrual accounting, the government is required to recognize this cost as it improves transparency and better reflects the true cost of operations. With respect to capital investments, for the 2015-16 fiscal year, capital expenditures and equity investments in public entities are forecast to be approximately 50.3 million Cayman Islands dollars. The 2015-16 budget allocates 31.3 million Cayman Islands dollars to be invested in assets of the core government, such as CI 10.5 million for the Ministry of Planning, Lands, agriculture, housing, and infrastructure for various capital projects, including CI 5.3 million relating to the revitalization of central Georgetown, and 3 million to cover gazetted land claims associated with planned road works. 8 million to the Ministry of District Administration, Tourism, and Transport for various capital projects, including 4.2 million towards the cruise berthing facility and 3.5 million for various capital projects on Cayman Brac. $5 million for the Ministry of Education, Employment and Gender Affairs toward the phase construction of John Gray High School. $2.2 million for the Ministry of Health and Culture for various capital projects including solid waste management. $2 million for the Minister of Home Affairs for capital projects relating to national security, and $1.5 million to the Ministry of Community Affairs, Youth, Sports, Youth and Sports for upgrades to the Hague Borden play field and to develop a walking track at the Borden Town Primary School. Additionally, a sum of $19 million will be invested in statutory authorities and government companies primarily to fund the debt service obligations of these entities. The major investments in this category are $9 million for the Cayman Turtle Farm 1983 Limited to fund debt servicing and operational losses, 
5.1 million to Cayman Airways Limited to fund debt servicing and capital expenditures, 2.4 million to the National Housing Development Trust to fund debt servicing obligations, and 1.5 million to the Cayman Islands Development Bank as part of the recapitalization of that entity. With respect to cash and debt management, Madam Speaker, during the 2015-16 fiscal year, total cash balances are expected to grow by 72 million, reaching 304 to 1.6 million by the 30th of June 2016. When this is achieved, it will be unprecedented for a year in which the government undertook no new borrowings. At the 1st of July 2015, the core government's debt is expected to be 523.4 million Cayman Islands dollars. Over the course of the 2015-16 fiscal year, the government will make principal payments of CI $20 million, thereby reducing the outstanding debt to 503.4 million Cayman Islands dollars by the 30th of June 2016. Madam Speaker, I would also like to share with my legislative colleagues that the Cayman Islands Development Bank, or CIDB, will make an early repayment of a U.S. $5 million bond before the end of this current fiscal year, 30th of June 2015, using its own reserves. This particular bond, Madam Speaker, is not legally due for payment until the 2015-16 financial year. However, early repayment will save the country on interest costs, strengthen the balance sheet of CIDB, and place the organization on a more sustainable footing going forward. This action is consistent with our prudent fiscal management policies and our unwavering resolve to reduce the public sector debt burden. Before 30th of June 2015, CIDB will refinance US 36.8 million of bullet bonds using amortizing structures that allow the repayment of debt principal over time and other factors being equal will result in less interest being paid when compared to the currently held bullet bonds. In addition to the early bond settlement, Madam Speaker, which strengthens the public sector's debt position, in 2014-15, government has contributed 17.1 million to a dedicated, sinking, dedicated debt service sinking fund. The total balance in the sinking fund now stands at CI $18 million. This fund will serve the government well in future years as other bonds mature and facilitate as other bonds mature and facilities that were executed with deferred principal payments fall due for payment. Therefore, Madam Speaker, the government's overall, the government's overarching fiscal policy for the 2015-16 budget will continue to center on, number one, controlling operating expenditures, number two, limiting capital investments, number three, decreasing public debt, and number four, no new long-term borrowings. Madam Speaker, as Colin Powell once said, a dream does not become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. And I would add to that, Madam Speaker, it takes courage. The people of these islands were called upon to make sacrifices during the difficult period of the recent global recession. As Minister with Responsibility for Finance, it is my duty and honor, along with my colleagues, to ensure that those sacrifices are not in vain, and to do my part in making sure that every dollar counts. Madam Speaker, it is critically clear to this government that our privilege to lead and our ability to make the necessary interventions to achieve the required broad outcomes for our society is only possible with the support of those we govern. The budget before you not only represents a significant accomplishment for government's finances, it represents that success can be achieved through sacrifice. The 2015-16 budget is a result of many sacrifices. This administration 
remain committed to returning our public finances to a sustainable position. And although having to make the responsible decisions was oftentimes difficult, it was absolutely necessary. Yet, given our tight fiscal constraints, the very fact that we have been able to maintain business as usual is an achievement in itself. Because even though the government's policy objectives were limited to the specifications of the PMFL, our approach to policy was limitless. And now, thanks to our innovative efforts and dedicated strategies, we are poised to achieve full compliance with all six principles of responsible financial management in the PMFL by the stipulated deadline of 30th June 2016. Madam Speaker, achieving compliance with, principles, with the principles means that government will not have to seek prior approval of the FCO to present an annual budget to the Legislative Assembly. However, it is important for the public to understand that such compliance does not mean that the government can take on significant borrowings in the future. If the effect of such new borrowings would breach the ratios in the principles of responsible financial management, the principles and their associated ratios have to be satisfied in all future fiscal years. Madam Speaker, it is also very important for it to be clearly understood that unless there are extenuating circumstances, in order to ensure that borrowing does not occur to balance future budgets, it is necessary that government's future expenditures do not grow at a faster rate than the country's economic growth. Such restraint on future expenditures will avoid the need for unreasonable or unnecessary increased taxes, fees, rates, and charges. I made this critical point in my 2014-15 budget address by stating, and I quote, however, our goal ought to be that we control government, government expenditure so that it grows at a slower rate than the overall economy for any given period. This is why, sorry, this is the only way of avoiding the risk of increased taxation or deficit spending financed by borrowing, unquote. Madam Speaker, it is worthy of repetition in this address. Madam Speaker, I therefore reiterate that I am proud of the accomplishments of this government and the, what it has achieved to date. We sacrificed our desires, we adjusted to our realities, and we transformed our challenges into opportunities. According to David McCullough, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, little of consequence is ever accomplished alone. Therefore, I would like to acknowledge that the preparation of the government's budget is an enormous undertaking, requiring the cooperation and commitment of many. I therefore wish to thank Her Excellency the Governor, the Honorable Premier, Cabinet Ministers, official members of Cabinet, Councillors, Chief Officers, and their staff. I would also like to extend my profound gratitude to all staff in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development that assisted in the preparation of the 2015-16 budget, document, budget documentation. Madam Speaker, it has been a privilege for me to stand before this Honorable House today. I thank you for your attention and to, be, and to God be the glory for great things he has done for the people of the Cayman Islands. I humbly commend the appropriation July 2015 to June 2016 <coughs> Bill 2015 to this Honorable House and ask all members for their support of the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker.